Thanks, Mark. Uh, great intro as always. Uh, on the weekend, I actually did a triathlon and um, it was blowing a gale suddenly. I don't know if you remember Sunday morning, but it was really blowing a gale suddenly winds. And, and I had to do this lap around a track on a bike. I'm pretty big, six foot six, 100 kilos. I, I have a lot of wind resistance. <laughs> and I was riding around this track and I was thinking, gee, I'm going pretty well here. And then I came down this straight and there was this massive headwind. And when I was going into it, I was like, geez, this is a huge headwind. But when I was riding around the other side, I didn't really notice the tailwind. And I thought, I've got to tell this story when I do the presentation on Wednesday because it's actually what we're seeing with a lot of companies. You know, when things are going really well, you don't realise you've got a lot of tailwinds. But when things start to go bad, you realise, oh, gee, that was actually pretty good before. And what we're seeing at the moment is things are going to get tougher for companies. And what I wanted to do today was, was touch on a few things with you. Um, the, the first is to share with you I guess how the macro has dominated markets, what we saw through reporting season, and then I'll move to some of the uncomfortable opportunities emerging, and in particular in value and growth. Now for those of you um, who, who don't know the Fire Trail High Conviction Fund, we've got two really big beliefs. The first is that every company has a price. Every different type of company can outperform in the right circumstances. The second one is that we believe you should invest in both value and growth, or not shut yourself off to one or the other, because through time, different types of companies can outperform as well. Let's get into it. I don't really like squiggly charts personally because I get bored, but this is a pretty simple squiggly chart. And, and what this one shows is how correlated companies are on the ASX 200. And, and what I take away from this is that there's been, it's usually pretty steady at 10 to 40%, but what happened in COVID was basically we had, there was just two types of companies. There were those companies who would win um, from being locked down, like a Woolworths, a Coles, um, some of the healthcare companies, and then there were the losers, travel companies and the like. And so everything became very, very correlated very, very quickly. And then things settled back down in the past couple of years, but then we've gone again. You, you might be thinking, what's driving this one? You probably know the answer, it's interest rates now. Companies who want higher interest rates, like insurance and banks generally, uh, resource companies to some extent, and then the losers, which are generally higher PE companies and companies that are highly indebted. And what, what we believe is that it's been very, very macro in the past four or five years, and we actually think as these things revert, it really is gonna turn into much more of a stock pickers market. Now, what we saw out of reporting season, I don't know where to stand here, this is such a big screen. I'll stand over here, get out of the way. But um, in reporting season, in a nutshell, we're definitely seeing the consumer want more services and want more travel. Um, you saw David put up a, a chart on Qantas, Qantas's capacity. For this June quarter coming up, if you look at, uh, because they pretty much know what their revenue is going to be, uh, in domestic, they're at 120% of pre-COVID revenue now. So there were some questions in COVID, will people ever want to travel again? They're now going to be 20% higher than they were pre-COVID domestically. Uh, internationally, leisure's almost there in terms of pre-COVID revenue, but corporate remains below. But even if you look within corporate, international, you've seen SMEs almost come back to pre-COVID, but large corporates still remain quite low. But we're seeing continued demand for leisure and services. The other one's camping. Um, really interesting to see in the super, uh, super retail group results, BCF, um, boating, camping, fishing their sales have actually continued to accelerate. So while others are starting to moderate, their sales continue to accelerate. So people really are preferencing uh, experiences. Uh, gee, you probably already know this one. Thank goodness we don't have to get too many of these anymore. Um, COVID tests, Helios reported their COVID testing uh, volumes down 88%. Um, so you know, if there was any question whether that's gonna be a structural theme or not, uh, I, th I think it's, it's pretty clear it's not. Um, and the other one, you know, we saw in the Harvey Norman and also within JB Hi-Fi, they own the good guys. Uh, and we're seeing this offshore as well. Large, bulky items, outdoor furniture, patios are really on the nose now. If you've, if you've got one big couch, if you've got one barbecue, you don't just keep buying them. So we saw this huge wave and now it's coming back and it's coming back quite quickly, particularly in those big, bulky items. But I do think it's... it's I'm very optimistic uh, most of the time. My wife says it's, quite, it's an, annoy, an annoying trait. Um, but things are getting harder. Things are definitely getting harder for businesses um, 
TV advertising in the March quarter down mid-teens. Now what that tells us is that companies are starting to try and offset inflation. They're starting to cut back on costs. Uh, hiring intentions are falling. We saw the Seek uh, job ads today, they're down 12% now. Uh, we caught up with the Seek management team. What they believe is they see, because um, the unemployment rate data is quite lagged, they're actually at the front end because before you chop people, you stop hiring them. And so they see you know, pretty clear signs that hiring intentions are coming right back. And then finally, I thought this is really interesting, in small cap resources, some of these companies, particularly in base metals, are struggling to make money at very high prices. And to give you an example, I'd use copper. Um, so, you know, copper previously, if we went back pre-COVID, people would say long-term prices need to be around $3, $3.50. Well, today they're $4. This is an exceptionally good price for copper at the moment. And yet what we're seeing from small cap copper miners is they are struggling to make money uh, because inflation is, is hitting them from all sides. It probably means over time resource prices need to go up, but in the short term resource earnings are getting smashed. So I'd say overall uh, the consumer's mixed. Uh, we've, it's, you know, there's a recession coming, the consumer's going to collapse in six months' time. In six months' time, we've been saying that for about 18 months now. I'd say what we're seeing is consumer's mixed, but the business conditions are getting tougher. That probably will lead to more pressure on the consumer as well. Now what I wanted to do was um, step into two types of companies. Um, the first one is a value company and the second one is a growth company. But I'll give you the idea behind the first one and it comes with banks. And the, the company we've got is not in the banking space but we think our investment's a lot better than the banks. But firstly I wanted to share with you what we saw from the banks in reporting season. The best of the banks is behind us. If you look at the portfolio, the way the High Conviction Fund portfolio is positioned today, we have got no shares in Commonwealth Bank, no shares in NAB, no shares in Westpac, and a small position in ANZ. We just think the best is behind them. Now, uh, Commonwealth Bank put up this chart here, and it's net interest margin through time. And what you can see is it's been in decline generally, and if you go back 20 years, it's, it's generally been in decline as ROEs have been eroded by competition. But if you look at this downdraft here, this was COVID, and rates started coming back. And so last year, uh, the banks was the place to be because they had massive earnings upgrades as interest rates came off zero. The Commonwealth Bank spooked the market because at their uh, February results, uh, Matt Common talked about NIMS peaking in October. Interestingly, on the 10th of February this year, despite all the headwinds and everything going on, Commonwealth Bank hit an all-time high. An all-time high. So you think about how bearish potentially you are how bearish the market is, how bad it's going to be for everyone. Commonwealth Bank was all-time highs 30 days ago. They're now talking about margins peaking. Here's some of the other things they said. They said competition's actually quite high. Um, they, they're talking about home loan pricing across the industry below the cost of capital. Uh, we saw Suncorp as well. We saw NAB yesterday. Everyone agrees home loans written today are below cost of capital. The market's very competitive. And it's actually very hard for them to reprice because could you imagine a bank going out with an out-of-cycle rate increase at the moment? You know, great way to get regulated. So I think it's going to be, remain very competitive in home loans. Um, we've talked about peaking October margins. So we believe bank margins have peaked and the best is behind the banks. We've got a really big, or, or actually a very little position, a big underweight in, in banks. But the value stock we've got today is, is QBE. Uh, it's one of the largest positions in the High Conviction Fund today. Uh, we do believe it's poised for our performance. Now, if I had have got up here three years ago on QBE, probably would have had some steaks or chicken thrown at me because QBE was seen as uninvestable. And it was uninvestable for probably 10 years because what they did, I was talking to uh, Matt Booker earlier about roll-ups and they're great when you're on them, but then when they peak, they get really, really bad. And so QBE was a roll-up. The idea was just keep buying insurance books, tack them on, you know, maybe take a bit more risk um, on, the, on the way you're hedging. But it came undone eventually. And then what QBE had to do was really for the next 10 years from 2012 uh, is to shed bad insurance. They had to try and reprice it and if they couldn't reprice it, they'd get rid of it. What you've seen more recently is that premiums have been growing but not through acquisitions. This is a very good insurance cycle that we're seeing at the moment. And if you look at what QBE has put through in prices, uh, you can see they've put through 30% cumulative price increases on the book over the last two and a half years. Uh, I know 
many of you use insurance, so hopefully you do. Um, I unfortunately do. We had Suncorp in the other day. They were talking about uh, motor up mid-teens for the latest renewals, uh, home with a 20, you know, 20 handle, so 25%. Uh, very aggressive uh, insurance cycle at the moment. And we don't believe the market's giving QB any credit for some of the underlying improvements they've done to the book from this prior period. Now, one thing we like about QBE is that they have actually improved the business. If we look at what we call the combined operating ratio, I won't get too technical, but it's basically whatever you write in premium, you take off your claims and take off your expenses, and that's what's left over. It doesn't include any interest margin you get. So lower is better, and what you can see is it's been on a steady path of improvement over the last few years. And so we think the core business has actually improved through time. And QBE also benefits from rising rates. Now, you know, interest rates are going to be inherently uncertain in the next little while. Um, they were always uncertain, to be honest. Just feels like they're more uncertain at certain periods. But we think it's very unlikely that interest rates will go back to where they were. Uh, even if they come off a little bit, we think we're going to be at a higher level. And QBE is very levered to higher interest rates. In fact, a 1% increase in two-year rates translates to a 17% increase in earnings. So you've got this business, QBE, which is improved a lot, it's going through a very good cycle and the in interest rates have uh, improved the earnings too and it's on less than 10 times PE on a CY23 basis. So we think it's a very attractive proposition and we think compared to the banks where competition's eating earnings, it's a very attractive opportunity. Now what I want to do is change it a bit and go to, to, go to growth uh, because we've got a large position in ResMed as well in the portfolio. Everyone knows ResMed. If you don't, I'll, I'll give you 20 seconds on it. But they help with sleep disorders. Um, it's not a very nice device, in my opinion. Uh, you put a, a mask on your face and you've got a little machine next to you. But what it does, it keeps your airways open. And so anyone who has sleep apnea, um, asthma, any kind of respiratory illness will typically be referred a, a ResMed device. ResMed has a huge market opportunity. There's estimated about a billion people in the world with some kind of respiratory, device, uh, respiratory illness. There's a co core cohort, as I call it, of around 400 million uh, who have sleep apnea, and they've got 20 million customers today. So ResMed is a growth business. There's, no, uh, there's information here. I don't think there's any insights. We'll get onto that on the, next, on the next page. It's a market leader, though. It's a great growth business. I think what's really interesting is that it's a three-player market that ResMed operates in. It's ResMed, the market leader, then it's Philips, and then it's Fisher and Paykel. And Gillian talked about the supermarket industry very concentrated. You've got Coles and Woolworths, they're 70% market share. ResMed and Philips are 90% market share. 90%. And what happened in June 21 was that uh, Philips undertook a recall of five and a half million devices. So if you think ResMed have got 20, Philips are out there recalling five and a half million devices. Now the reason they had to recall these devices is because the FDA told them to do so. And what was, they had a problem with their device and that was the little box which drives the continuous pressure. Um, it had memory foam in it that could ignite and it would basically create a, um, a carcinogenic stream of air that would then go into people's lungs. So these people who already have respiratory illness then get burning foam it's, it's a terrible uh, thing to happen, and uh, Philips have really been out of the market since then. Now, with that background, the market's view is, and what Philips are saying publicly is, oh, well, this, we're going to solve this. Um, we're going to be out there selling pretty soon. But we've seen this movie before, because you could look at what's happened to Cochlear. Now, Cochlear had a major recall. It's a great business today, but if you go back 10 years, it would have been the worst business to own, uh, because in 2011, they had a major recall due to safety in one of their devices. And what you saw was for the next, really, eight years, they lost market share. And they were the market leader. And so while the market's view today is that Philips has got this one-off recall, it'll be fine, just think about what, would, what you would do if you're a salesperson in the Philips team. You've got this major recall, all your clients hate you, you can't sell any devices. If you're any good, you're probably going to leave. And there's a lot of disruption that happens through that. Firstly, they're going to have to replace devices. We think this could go on for many years not just one year. Now, I guess the good news from here today, although you know, disappointing news for Firetrail, is that this investment hasn't paid off. 
Um, usually we get up here and we have these charts that go up like this and how good are we and all these kind of things, but this one hasn't really paid off. If you look at ResMed's performance versus the ASX200, it's been broadly flat over the past little while. And the reason for that is because of the chip shortage. Um, so Marcus talked about, you know, we've never seen chips go short before. What happened was ResMed were trying to make as many machines as they could, but they couldn't get enough chips to make them. So they were telling customers who were trying to buy from them, including many of Philips customers, we can't serve you. So they've missed some of that opportunity, but these clients are still banking up in, in what we call a backlog. And we do believe that's gonna be realized over the coming six to 12 months. So this is a stock that we think is very attractive. It's got a core growth business, but it's got this amazing opportunity where their biggest competitor is out of the market. So let me put this together for you. We, we talked up front about the macro. I think there are gonna be a lot of headwinds that are here now. We believe they're also gonna get worse. The level of correlation in the market is very high at the moment. It's, it's unprecedented. It's up there with COVID, pre-COVID levels, or sorry, during COVID levels. Um, secondly, I outlined the case for why QBE is much better than the banks. And then also why ResMed with its major competitor out of the market is also an outstanding opportunity on the growth side. Uh, the High Conviction Fund, we really appreciate your support if you are an investor. And if you don't invest, you know, please consider it because we're implementing a concentrated portfolio with a proven track record. Thanks very much. Thanks, Blakey.